My name is uh, George Doyce, and welcome to our Allies and Appetizers for this month. Um, we, I'm going to intro uh, Peculiar a little bit and talk about Allies and Appetizers, and then I'll introduce our, our guest speaker. Uh, thank you for all those that are here with us and those that are, are uh, taking some time to zoom in. Um, this is always a very important conversation, and we value um, having everybody lean in and, and support what we're trying to accomplish. So initially, Peculiar actually started from an experience that Allison and I had when our 13-year-old son Stockton came out, and we desperately looked and sought out for resources. And as, a, as an individual, as a parent of faith and of a faith tradition, uh, I found that my faith was wanting. Uh, was deeply lacking in how do I love and connect with and support my queer child? And how do I maintain my connection to my God and to my Savior and to, to my beliefs? And also at the same time, and even more importantly, uh, come to an understanding on how do I attend to this beautiful child that I've been given? And so Allison and I went on this journey and over many, many years found out that there just wasn't, there, there's, there weren't, there are not resources there. What we also found is that there is a disconnect. There's a massive disconnection in the bridge between our faith community and our beautiful LGBTQ community. And, and we believe deeply that you do not need to throw away your, the, the, the things of your faith that connected you to the things that matter and that you certainly do not need to throw away your, your, your child or somebody that's in the community. And so we believe deeply that there's an ability to do that. And so that is really the purpose of Peculiar and what we're trying to accomplish. And so what we're trying to do is develop resources. So these conversations are resources, conversations from the queer community that open our hearts to understand the experience of somebody that's trying to come out that have, have also uh, dealt with some of the pain and the challenge inside of a, a religious faith community. And then also to support the conversation for parents and ecclesiastical leaders to, to more deeply understand what it really means to fully love all of God's children. And so we're, we're grateful for these opportunities to develop these resources and really change conversations and open people's hearts. So today we're, uh, we're honored to have another beautiful guest. Um, he, he would rather that I call him Stan. So I'm gonna call him Stan. Um, Stan has a, a beautiful history of being involved and deeply connected to spiritual things, um, connected to uh, religious spaces, his own community, his own culture, which we all know is very important to each of us individually. So we're excited to hear about his story, and we're also excited to hear about why he's really in this space. And I, I characterize this space as deeply sacred. So we're, we're excited to hear uh, from Stan, Stan Mitchell, and for him to share his experience. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, turn, uh, turn the mic over to Paul. Uh, Paul, too, just as, a, as another intro, is uh, Paul and I started Peculiar to help you know, continue this conversation. And I think it's important that you know that I'm straight and Paul is beautifully queer. And I think that's the bridge. <laughs> oh, can I tell you stories about how beautifully queer Paul is? <laughs> I wish you knew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. That's another episode. <laughs> so I'm going to flip the mic over to Paul, and then he will. Okay. Right. It's... Man, he does not want to let go. Thanks, George. Do we have a thumbs up for sound? Okay, great. Stan, thanks for coming today. We're excited to have you. Um, what we've typically done in the past is have each of our guests um, give us your basically your Marvel Comics origin story. Tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to this space. 
So, grew up in Arkansas, that's the urbane state to the east of here, um, and grew up in a small rural community, northeast Arkansas, both sides of my family, a hundred years in that little town. Um, dad was one of 15. People always say, Mormon? I say, no, uh, northeast Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> um, grew up incredibly fundamentalist Pentecostal. Interestingly, our group, the group that I grew up in, was uh, an incredibly exclusivist group of Pentecostals. When we studied comparative world religions, we were studying the Baptist and the Methodist. That's how exclusivist that we were. We, we not only knew that Hindus and Buddhists were separated from God, and we not only felt that way about Catholics, and then you just keep coming in, Mormons and Jehovah's Witness and Baptists and Methodists, we we felt we were the only group. Tell me if this story sounds familiar. Our group, our denomination, a very small denomination, felt, truly felt that the church went dormant somewhere between the first and third century. With the death of the apostles, there was a fall off. There was this atrophy spiritually, and the church was essentially dormant. And my predecessors, my progenitors in the little Pentecostal denomination at the turn of the 20th century a small group of people got a revelation from God and found out that we were the only ones with that revelation and then became responsible to evangelize the world. Um, so I, I don't know, if that's probably, that's, that sounds odd to y'all, I know. <laughs> long, story, long story short, raised in that denomination, it was so exclusivist, I mean, we literally believed we were the only ones saved, but that's even stretching it. We really didn't think we were saved, most of us. <laughs> we, thought, we thought if anybody had a chance, it would be the best of us. That's how fear-based we were. Um, I became a young preacher at 16 in that very non-academic, rural, Pentecostal world. My dad was, again, one of 15. He's the only one of 15 siblings with a high school degree. That's how far back we come from. Um, but in that little world, I, I was kind of conscripted in the ministry at 16. Any young male with ardor, zeal, the ability to talk is going to be enlisted quickly, and that mantle is going to be put on you. By the time I was 18, I was preaching 200, 250 nights a year around the country, and this Pentecostal firebrand young evangelist parroting the message. At 20 years old, at 20 years old, my unwitting Methodist neighbor lady gave me a book by Max Licato. In our denomination, we could not read what was called external literature. We could only read literature written within our denomination. So when she slipped me that book, she didn't slip it, she gave me the book. I, it, was, it was propaganda. Um, and it was, it was the closest. Johnny Carson said when he was 16, he was so innocent, he used to go out behind the barn and do nothing. <laughs> that's pretty that's pretty much my life we were very puritanical um and uh, and I, that little max Licato book i was supposed to throw it away but i put it under my bed for whatever reason it's the closest thing i had to a playboy <laughs> under my bed it was a max Licato <laughs> book that's as scandalous as i got again a year later i pulled the book out for whatever reason and scandalized myself by reading it. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, the mind once exposed to a better idea can never shrink to its original size. And of course, when logic runs out within fear-based exclusivist religions, there's always, beyond logic and rationale, there's always plenty of fear to take over. Because we were told, if you ever do question these things, you should plan on that because that's Satan attacking you. And if those things outside the norm, if they sound reasonable to you, well, that's true because the carnal mind's at enmity with God. So even in the walls, at the periphery of our truth, those walls were even permeated, saturated with these, with these fear-based ideas that manipulated and kept us in. But I was, I was so moved by the things that this Church of Christ man wrote I couldn't imagine that some, I, I just couldn't frame that somebody lost could write so movingly about Jesus. 
So I I talked to my granddad about it, and he he told me about Balaam's donkey and how just because God uses something doesn't mean that you know it's necessarily saved. That God can use anything. You know, essentially God used a jackass in the Old Testament so he can use an asshole in the New Testament. <laughs> was essentially the message, except he didn't. <laughs> but the point for me was it, it cracked a door. Everybody talks about, in our circles, especially those of us that have moved beyond, you know, our wards and churches and our denomination, they call it deconstruction. Deconstruction sounds too active for me because I was not purposefully deconstructing. I was a traditionalist, a sentimentalist. I wanted to stay within the faith of my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. I'm not a rebel without a cause. I don't, I, the role that I'm in now is very awkward for me because I don't enjoy being despised. I don't walk up to a fight and say, is this a private fight? Can anybody join? <laughs> my personality is to try to make peace. So I'm an, I'm, I'm an unusual codependent prophet. <laughs> I, I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't deal. I, my mind was opened, it was cracked ajar, and the only way that I can explain it is that as that young preacher, behind the scenes, in my own theological closet, I bibliographied my way upstream. I realized pretty quickly in the evangelical world, and it would be true in your world, that if you really want to know what a Christian author believes, especially a conservative Christian author, don't read what they write. Read who they read. If you really want to find out where they're at, look at their bibliography. Find out who they're reading, because they're always reading beyond where they are, because they're writing for a milieu, plus or minus 5%, where they got to toe the party line to get published. And from Max Licato, I found people a little farther out in the bibliography. I read their books, and by myself, under the cover of night, I just bibliographied my way upstream. I was taught that that little puddle of water called the United Pentecostal Church was the vast ocean of God's kingdom. And then, by grace, a little ford or tributary broke off from that puddle, and it, and the stream turned into a creek and the creek turned into a tributary and the tributary turned into a river and then eventually the river dumped me out into this vast ocean and that little mud puddle was not the full kingdom of God at 27 I ended up in Nashville I left my denomination which was incredibly painful for me um, when I left my dad didn't eat for two weeks um, I was a kind of a boy wonder young preacher in that and had my place in that world, but I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't I couldn't keep parroting something that I didn't believe. So I left, went to a large evangelical church that took me in as a teaching pastor in Nashville. And and, and the puddle grew to a pond, but it was still a pond because it was still evangelical and it was still, you know, everybody else is lost. It was just a a broader form of exclusivism, and I couldn't shut my brain off. I couldn't close my heart. And while there, it was a large church. I it was eight or nine thousand members. So professionally, for a twenty-seven, twenty-eight-year-old kid, you know, I was preaching to four thousand people a weekend, and and it was heady stuff. But I was dying inside, and for I hadn't talked about that in a while. But for seven years. I just kept reading the books, trying to preach on Sunday, trying to have some sense of alignment in my soul. And I finally, it was not deconstruction for me, back to my earlier point, it was disorientation. It wasn't something I actively did, it was something that happened to me. And I became so disoriented that eventually I left ministry, kind of crashed and burned psychologically around 32, broke that church's heart and left. And still, still felt a sense of wanting to connect with existential matters. Didn't, as dirty as the water was, it did not totally conceal the beauty of the baby that was in it. So I never, you know, turned completely away from spirituality, even theism. But I made my way to the 12-step world. And 
at that time, I had never had a drink of alcohol. I had never gotten into pornography. It was a very puritanical world that I lived in. But I had just heard about the 12-step world, that there was a freshness and a freedom and a way they talked about God and life that I, I thought maybe it would be safe for me. So I ended up at 33 in an AA meeting down on Music Row, started by a guy named George Ritchie, jo uh, Paul Ritchie, rather. Paul Ritchie, his brother George Ritchie, was Tammy Wynette's husband. He is an old-time guy in country music. He was Johnny Cash's sponsor when he came back from Betty Ford as an alcoholic. They started that little AA meeting, and it was this crusty group of old music veterans. And I wandered into that meeting, and the way they talked about God, they were all former Christians and now just sober, old music executives. But the way they talked about God in life was very moving. There's not supposed to be a leader, but Paul was kind of the chief moderator of the group, you could tell. He and George, his brother that was married to Tammy Wynette, their dad was a general Baptist preacher, very conservative preacher in northeast Arkansas, where I came from. So we had that connection. None of those old guys had gone to church for years. and They began, they were kind of legalistic on the AA side of things. They began smelling out that I wasn't an alcoholic. <laughs> and so they started... I mean, this is my journey with all this. They started They started encouraging me discreetly at first, uh, you know, in roundabout ways that maybe this wasn't the meeting. They liked alcoholics at their meeting. And <laughs> so they started kind of intimating that I should go to maybe adult children of alcoholics or something else. And finally, after one meeting, and I never talked, I never... I just listened and I cried. And it wasn't about their alcoholism. It was just about their humanity and the way they talked about God and life. And finally, one meeting that night, one of the guys was a little more direct. And he said, Stan, we've been kind of talking. And we think this may not be the meeting for you. And um, we think maybe, and I started crying. They didn't know who I who I was or what I had done there in Nashville. And it, our church, it was a big church. I mean, like 8,000 members. And it was, it's where Dolly Parton and the Judds, and, which is such a sad part. I, it, was, it was where all the country music people went. But somehow these guys didn't know that connection. I was just standing there. And I started crying. And it hit me. And I was not trying to be a smart aleck. It hit me. And I looked at them through tears. And I said, I said, okay, if I start drinking, would you let me stay? <laughs> <laughs> and I meant it. Yeah. And they got quiet. And Paul, who was sitting down at the end of the table, he, was, he looked at me, and I thought he was angry, the one whose dad was a general Baptist preacher. He was probably 70 at this point. He just stared at me, and I started apologizing. I said, I'm serious. I, I'll drink if that's what it takes for me to stay. And after a little bit, Paul slammed his fist down on the table, and he said, which is this terrible language, and I don't use this word normally, but I'll never forget it for emphasis. He slammed his fist down, and he said, God damn it, fellas. We've become the church that we hate. And he softened, and he looked at me, and he said, we'd love you to stay, son. Well, that, I continued to find healing there. And about a year later, Paul said, you know, we were talking one night. Everybody always, they don't drink anymore. They smoke like crazy, and we're standing outside <laughs> smoking. And <laughs> Paul said, you know, he said, I, he said, I. He said, I don't I didn't think I'd ever say this. He said, there ain't nothing about the church I miss, but I do kind of miss Jesus. And he said, I, I wonder if there aren't a bunch more like us. He said, why don't we, you ever think about getting back in ministry? And for me, if I did have an addiction, it was people and their approval. And my supplier was always the church. And as a young minister, I just transferred athletic academic skills over to being this great young preacher. And still it was just like heroin, you know, just... I felt so, I knew God couldn't stand me. And people adulating me did not give me a high. It just brought me up from the low.
it just relieved some of that. And so for him to ask me to maybe think about starting church again, that was like asking an alcoholic to go back to their job as a bartender. And I started shaking almost. And But anyway, we started Grace Point in 2003, and we started it to be a deconstruction, disorientation zone for evangelicals, Catholics, Mormons, people coming from exclusivistic Christian backgrounds that couldn't quite throw Jesus away but didn't think they could ever do church again. We, we, we weren't just one of these kind of mega evangelical churches where the preacher untucks his shirt, spikes his hair, and it's the same message. We literally were a deconstruction zone where we said you can fall apart here. You don't have to believe anything. We didn't have a statement of faith, and we started with 12 of us. Paul was one of the beginners of the, and it grew to, from 2003 to 2012, it grew to about 3,000 members. We were hated in the evangelical community because we were, we were labeled as liberal progressive just because we were open, and it was, it was just that. It was a place you could fall apart, and it grew and grew and grew, and then in 2012, and that's all I wanted it to be, just a place for, honestly, when people were kind of put back together and they left the church, it felt like a success to me when they were able to go on healthily and they didn't have to stay. But in 2012, the Marriage Amendment Act came out, and one of our members was a country music star, and the BBC interviewed her, and she said, well, my pastor's a dear friend, and I know he's fully affirming, and our church is gay-friendly. And Westboro Baptist decided to come picket us that weekend. And the church was this deconstruction zone. A third of our church, a thousand of our folk, were very liberal Christians. I mean, closer to Unitarian than evangelical. A third of the church was distinctly deconstructed people who were in the process of deconstructing, didn't know what they believed, but were scared to death and trying to put it together. And a third of the church were evangelicals that I had tricked by <laughs> how good a church was. I, I was still very evangelical in my ethos because I was trying to convert them to a, liberal <laughs> to a liberal Christianity. I didn't think about that then, but who am I? You know, but, and the problem with that third of the church that third of the church gave about 70% of the money because those conservative evangelicals tithe a lot better than deconstructed liberals. <laughs> and so a third of the church, when Carrie said that on the BBC, a third of the church said, well, yeah. A third of the church said, oh, my, what are you talking about? And a third of the church said, we're what? <laughs> At that point, the whole the whole method of being a deconstruction zone ended, and I went to the elders and said, "I I don't think this is going to work anymore." And they said, "Why?" And I said, "Because now, as I've been as I've been moderating, kind of curating this deconstruction space, the church was full of queer people." And the reason it was full of queer people, it was kind of like the segregated South. It was better than slavery, but not where it needed to be. Queer people at Grace Point were like the Syrophoenician woman. Everywhere else, they starved to death. But at our church, at least they could be under the table and eat the wine-stained crumbs that inadvertently fell from our mouth after communion. That's who they were. It was a better deal. It's a better deal till it's not. Eventually, that placard over the water fountain you think, I think I'd rather die of thirst than drink that. But that's where it was, and they were so much, there were so many of them there that I went to the elders and said, I guess I have to out myself now as a fully liberal Christian pastor. They said, why? And I said, because when Jody and Mary asked me to marry them, when Michael and Josh asked me, I can't say no. I have an ethic in my ordination. I cannot look at my members and deny them an ordination or a sacrament that I believe they merit. And when I do that, it's going to be, it's going to be, the skinny's going to be up on what we do. The elders looked at me. It was an, you know, we had a $52,000 a month payment. We were a non-denominational church. We didn't have a denomination to fall back on. The elders didn't want me to leave. They also didn't want the church to bleed out on the table if I did a wedding the next week. So I compromised with them legitimately and said, 
Give me two to three years to lead this church through a period of discernment on LGBTQ inclusion. Not loving them, but respecting them. We talk a lot about we need to love the LGBTQ community. Evangelical LDS people love them. They love them enough to tell them that they're sinning. <laughs> Listen, I didn't change my heart toward queer people. I changed my mind about what scripture said. That's a big distinction. We got to be careful just saying we got to love them. We got to love them. We got to love. We do have to love them. They deserve more than our love. They deserve our respect because same gender romantic love is not sin. It is as celebrated by God as heterosexual. So we need to make that clear because I have people walk up to me in Franklin all the time, Nashville all the time, and they walk up to me, former parishioners, and they cock their head sideways with this look of magnanimity and compassion. And they say, Stan, I want you to know. I still love you. <laughs> and that still is so freighted with, in spite of how bad you are, right. lucky for you, yeah. I'm so great. <laughs> you are loved. <laughs> and so I think we're going to be, so anyway, we went in that two to three year period of discernment. In 2014, December, our former minister of music, our first minister of music, who was gay, one of my best friends growing up, he bought hook, line, and sinker, what Grace Point was doing, and after a year as our minister of music, he came out to me, ended up going through a divorce. It was a really tough time in his life. Grace Point wasn't ready to process that. He left the church. We remained friends. Nine years later in 2014, he's getting married, and that was my first wedding in December of 2014 at the Country Music Hall of Fame, 300 guests, and it was quite an affair. He married a guy named Sparkle Josh, so it wasn't, I wanted two, <laughs> I wanted two little gay guys in matching plaid, you know, sweaters under a tree somewhere, but I got Sparkle Josh and Michael, and they're, and they're still their friends. Long story short, I'll finish, uh, that's 2015 now, statement of inclusion, we go from 3,000 people down to about 400 in a year. And a $1.8 million income goes down to about 350. Yeah. We sell our 23 acre campus. I spend 2015 to 2019 helping the church stabilize. It's a wonderful church now. We have about three or 400 wonderful members, run about 150 to 200 on Sunday. And in 2019, I was able to move over to founding pastor, which is, you know, queen of England. No responsibility, no power, just lots of glory. I sit in the back and hand out bulletins and make sure everybody knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> All the new folk. But I had to move over in 2019. Number one, I was burned out. So I, I, I'm not queer, but I've, I've said a lot. If you say you're an ally to a group of people and you're not getting hit by at least a few of the stones thrown at them, you're not standing close enough. So... You know, to, to some, to stabilize the church, turned it over because I was burned out, and even more now. All I do uh, as a post evangelical pastor who's done this, I now travel around, and about a fourth of my work. I was here this weekend working with Methodist pastors who are towing this threshold, and are in a non-affirming denomination and are struggling. So I travel around. A fourth of my work is I like right now in my consulting. I have about 15 churches I'm actively working with. Three-fourths of my work, though, is just pastoral care for LGBTQ people and their families all around the country who are in little towns in Nevada and West Virginia and Delaware and, and California, and, and they don't have a grace point within 300 miles. And they reach out to me because they read the stories that I post on Facebook. And I do pastoral care for a diaspora of queer Christians who can't take their kid back to the Assembly of God Church that they've been in for 40 years, and they don't know what to do, and they don't know if it's sin or not. They know their kid. They're struggling. Y'all have all been there. I just serve as a pastor to those people, so that's all I do now. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> uh, I'm struggling with how to compose a question. So often faith is taken away from us by a policy or a, um, a practice or someone that said something. 
well-intentioned even. I think what you just said is really important, Stan, about, about the ability to be an ally and the ability or the need for people of faith to show up for the queer community. What do you think, how do you think, maybe it's, maybe it's what would you tell an LGBTQ plus person who is struggling, who doesn't have the benefit of speaking to you on a regular basis, and maybe this is some of the work that you do with your diaspora, as you said. What do you say to someone who, they have a testimony of, of Christ or of the Torah, or they have a belief in their teachings in a Muslim faith or any faith system that has, has actually and, and officially rejected them? How do you tell them to stay on? How do you tell them to stay with their faith? What, what would be the a step that you would give them to start with? Well, I mean, that's, I deal with that person every day, as you might imagine. Um, I don't tell them to stay on with their faith. I, I just don't anymore, as much as I would like that to happen, because I don't think they have to lose their faith. I have, I have been with enough of these people who come from exclusivistic religions, and that is so intertwined that there is a there is a literally diagnosable PTSD in the connection. And their agnosticism, even atheism, often is a healthy psychological step. To the point that I, I've said I've said many times, which I, I didn't, my disorientation did not start around whether gay people are included. My disorientation started as a 12 year old child over whether Uncle Bud and Aunt Bernice were included because they went to the Assembly of God Church. So my issues with who's in and who's out started long before I got to the sexuality thing. It started, I mean, our people picketed Billy Graham crusades, literally. So by the time by the time I, I got to homosexual people or bisexual people or pansexual people or trans people, I had already been dealing with that issue of inclusion with other groups of people a long time. And what I found is people coming from highly exclusivistic groups, the intertwining of all these things is so severe that they have to separate to some degree. My brother was one of those, not queer, but when I loudly went into ministry at 16, my 18-year-old brother, who never bought any of it, quietly slipped out the side door. And you can imagine who got the most good attention. And he became, he became homiletic fodder for my sermons. 35 years later, my brother and I are very close. My brother, I suppose, would be a reverent, loving, agnostic humanist. 35 years later, as we look back, we were at a Pittsburgh Steelers game here while back we went to together because we were Steelers fans, and we were walking. He's a very understated person, and he said, you ever worry about me, bub? And I, I said, about, about, he said, you know, the whole afterlife thing and Jesus and all that, and I said, no, and it hit me. It just dropped down in my heart. I said, Steve, what you rejected, you did not reject God and Jesus. You rejected such a horrible facsimile of God and Jesus that if Jesus does turn out to the guy, I think your agnosticism has in its way been a moral defense of Jesus, not a rejection of him. And I think he'll shake your hand and say, thank you for taking up for me. So the people that I, I, I deal with, I, I, I love walking beside even those who have to detach and untwine that because like my brother, I, I think they technically in their mind have academically untwined from some things that their lives still, I mean, Jesus isn't going to say well-believed one day. He's gonna say well done. And I think a lot of those people are still doing really well. Now, for the ones who are sentimentalist and who have the capacity to look beyond the hurt, I, I love walking with them. And what I would say to them is I'm that person. Because when you first come out of an exclusivistic, fear-based religion, especially for queer people with all of that damage and scar tissue, 
I think it's very easy to look at that entire experience and say that was poison. What, I, what I've seen, though, is as you live a while, distancing yourself from lamenting the fact, even cursing the poison, I think, for me, I've seen a lot of people begin to realize that probably wasn't poison. It was probably contaminated water. And just like the child that I recently was with in Haiti who was drinking out of sewage, I said, how do you tell that child not to drink the sewage water when it's the only water they have? The water that I grew up with in the UPC was not poison. It had contaminants in it. What you guys grew up with, a part of the beauty of what you are is in spite of the contaminants, there was water there. What they told us about the Savior, what they told us about these things, there was water there. And I look back at those days, and I don't remember a bunch of hypocrites trying to hurt me. I remember a bunch of people doing the best they could with the information they had, and I was one of them. And the Jesus water that I got back then, in spite of the contaminants, hydrated me, kept me alive, and I am alive to be able now to detox from the contaminants. And so to walk with people and to help them tease out what is the H2O spiritually and what are the contaminants, I, I think that's a that's a lovely process that obviously a, a lot of you guys have done to some degree. Paul Ricoeur, the French existential philosopher, said life moves generally through three stages. We have the pre-critical stage, we have the critical stage, and the post-critical stage. The pre-critical stage he calls first naivete. The critical stage he calls sophistication. The post-critical phase he calls second naivete. First naivete, there is a Santa Claus, a literal North Pole, reindeers are real, the guy comes down the chimney, disperses presents, there's a workshop, all of that's literal. The critical phase, sophistication is, pfft, no Santa Claus. Second naivete is the ability to capture the wonder, to understand mythology, to understand how legends accrete, to understand that myth isn't the opposite of truth. It is a truth that is not rooted in fact as much as it's rooted in something so embedded in us that it will bubble up through a thousand languages and culture. So when my 10-year-old daughter found out at 10 years old there was not a Santa Claus because her mother wanted her to believe that as long as she could, I'll never forget the first emotion in my daughter was shock. The second, she was incredulous. The second emotion, second emotion was sadness. She was so sad. The third emotion was embarrassment. Wait a minute. All of my friends knew at eight. The fourth emotion I watched in a 10 year old child about Santa Claus was anger. Who the and then the response to the embarrassment and anger was what Ricoeur called sophistication. She became very indignant <laughs> toward any five-year-old. Anytime we were around children that believed in Santa Claus, she'd be like, <laughs> And she was convinced that any parent who taught them that was a liar and doing it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> And she was so, Ricoeur said, first naivete, sophistication, sophistication, I mean, you, you leave your exclusivistic religion and then you become this fundamentalist liberal that is just as bereft of love or maybe more and just angry and dry. It's just, it's, it is a natural part of the process, a natural part of the grieving process, but man, it is no place to stay. Honest to God. I think I'd rather stay back in first naivete than land in the dry desert of criticism, sophisticated and angry the rest of my life. So one day we're driving down the road. We just left my my best friend's house, Justin Pitty. He has three kids. They're our God, my God kids. And they're a few years younger than Nina. And they were Santa Clausing it up. And the entire time she was huffing. I mean, it was like awful. <laughs> she was just like, oh, oh just, just 
idiots, you know, just <laughs> looking, at, looking at Justin like, how could you do this to them? <laughs> and we're on our way home, and I said, sis, can I tell you something? And, I, and, and you not think I'm messing with you? And she said, what? And I said, I need to tell you something really important, and you're going to think I'm messing with you, but I'm not. We pull over the side of the road. I looked at her, and I said, I believe in Santa Claus. She looked at me and she said, no, you don't. And I said, I do. She said, Dad, I mean, like, you're an idiot. How could you, the pig returning to its mire, the dog going back to its vomit, how could you? And I said, listen to me. And I told her about a guy named Nicholas who lived in southern Turkey. And I told him the story, heard the story of how he loved children and he gave. And I told her the story of how as time develops, there are legendary accretions that develop in the story. I said, you know how when I tell you stories about Uncle Junior and Uncle Bud, you can tell I'm from Arkansas. Uncle Junior, Uncle Bud, and Uncle Sonny. <laughs> I said, I tell you these stories. And I said, sometime Bub, her brother, I said, sometime Bub will say, Dad, did that really happen? You know what? You remember what I say? I say, you know, I'm not sure, but I know it's true. Because <laughs> Jesus didn't say the facts will set you free. He said the truth will. The truth is a lot deeper than facts and science. And I told her about Nicholas and how he became St. Nicholas. And I told her about how hundreds of years, sometimes we don't think we can carry the goodness in our, on our shoulders, so we create these legendary figures to project the goodness on and then meet it out to ourselves. And I told her about how when I, when I left off with a literal Santa Claus and literal reindeers, sophistication for me thought that meant it was much less than that. But Richard Rohr says, the Catholic priest Richard Rohr and Ricoeur said that eventually the dry desert of criticism runs out of oasis. And in the dryness, we hear a call, a whisper from the wings of the stage, and we are called again to a second naivete. We are called from our desert of criticism and sophistication to a second naivete where the wonder is restored and Santa Claus is not less than that. Santa Claus is more than that. And that scenario with Nina is very much the scenario for people of faith with Jesus and resurrections and afterlifes and kingdoms and all of that. I, Joni Mitchell, when she was 24, wrote a song called Both Sides Now. I don't know how she wrote it at 24. There's three verses, and the three verses are all about first naivete, sophistication, and second naivete. The first verse is about clouds. First naivete clouds, rows and flows of angel hair, and ice cream castles in the air, feathered canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that way. Sophistication, criticism. But now, they only block the sun. They rain and they snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in my way. Second naivete. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down. And still somehow it's clouds illusions I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. Second verse is about love. Moons and Junes and Ferris wheels the dizzy dancing way that you feel. When every fairy tale comes true, I've looked at love that way. Criticism. But now it's just another show. Leave them laughing when you go, and if you care, don't let them know. Don't give yourself away. Second naivete. I've looked at love from both sides now. From give and take, still somehow, it's love's illusions, I recall. I really don't know love at all. So whether it's UPC, LDS, Church of Christ, Catholic, fundamentalist, Muslim, it's the same story, plus or minus 5%. It's a group of people wounded by fears about God. And if there, I don't know, I don't know that theism and Christianity are going to survive. I think they will. I believe they are real. 
I can't tell somehow, depending on my own journey. There are times that I think I'm doing reparative work to help my religion mature into a more loving, mature place. I think there's progressive revelation or we're growing. And my best, are, there are times, though, at the end of the day, sometimes it, it wears me down. And I think maybe all I'm doing is hospice palliative care for something that I think I love that needs to die. But either way, it's noble work. And time will tell. So that's where I am with faith and spirituality. That's amazing. I think you've touched a lot of people in this conversation already today. One of the things that I think we talk a lot about in Peculiar is how do we how do we reach out to parents and family members, well-intentioned or maybe tolerant. We've talked about the scale of when you learn a new concept, the first time is awareness, and then it's tolerance, and then which I don't think is good enough, and I don't think acceptance. Oh. I think it's got to be all the way to the other side of embrace. What do you tell a parent of a queer child or a family member? Because it is a different conversation than those of us who have left a faith or are struggling with not feeling included with our religion. What do you tell the family member who is struggling to accept their child or their niece or their cousin about their faith? And what would the ab advice you would give them? I, I, I like your reference to, you know, helping palliative care or um, hospice. But for someone who doesn't believe that, who believes that they're in the middle of it and that their mission and perhaps the fact that they're already talking to you and would have a conversation is is already a step. What advice would you give someone in a tract or in a, 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 a one page? How do you tell those people to take their faith with their queer family member? Yeah, that's, I mean, that again, that's every day for me. That's exactly right in the breadbasket of what I do. I, I, I am not a bridge burner. Um, I, I don't. I don't start with the disagreement and the anger. I start conciliatory. I never start with parents by saying, and a lot of people who follow me on Facebook are still angry and mad and the comments are like, well, if these people just love their kid, I never look at parents and say, well, I mean, for me to look at them and say, you need to love your child. You know, like I love your, a stranger loves your child, you know, better than you do. I, I don't start there because that's not where I think they are. I always start with, listen, I know you love your child. I know you love your child more than I possibly. I have two kids. I know how much I love them. I know you love your child. I'm not coming to you saying you need to love your child. I mean, nothing could make a parent more angry or shut their ears more than for somebody they don't know to be messing around with their kid and acting like I love them more than you do. I look at parents all the time and say, I know you love your kid, and it's that love that I'm appealing to because you love your child so much. I, I want you to know I am a cisgender, heterosexual, evangelical pastor from Northeast Arkansas that would have never thought I would be in this space, but I am not in this space because I've quit being Christian. I'm in this space because of my Christianity. I'm not affirming and celebrating queer people in spite of my religion or in some tension with my religion. It is actually my religion that has brought me to this place. I'm not someone that had to jettison my faith to be okay with queer people. I couldn't have done that. I tell them the reality is this is a part of church history. What's happening with queer people immediately in your home and in a macro setting of culture, it's a part of church history. Because from the very beginning of the Christian church, we've been dealing with the matter of how broad is the gospel, how wide is the sweep of God's ark of mercy, and we've been getting it wrong forever. And fortunately, church history tells that story. We don't whitewash that. The church started with the Holy Spirit poured out on a group of Jewish people and the assumption by the Jewish people on which the Spirit was poured out who were followers of this Christ was that you had to be a Jewish person for that to happen. And it took the Acts 10 story with Peter and Cornelius for the church to open up and realize, oh my, you, you talk about an inclusion problem. 
in the first two to three years of the Christian church, we thought 99.9% .9 of the earth's population had no access to the gospel because of the way they were naturally born. And for, for the men, they weren't circumcised. It always gets in the shorts somehow. It really does. It always gets down there. It just does. So we don't have to wait till the 19th century and chattel slavery. We don't have to wait to the 70s and progressive revelation and segregation and all. We don't have to wait to modern times at the very beginning in the earliest template of the Christian church. We started with the capacity to get things terribly wrong and the lovely capacity to be corrected and get it right. And I think this is one of those moments, and it is a Christian ethic. This was my ethic as a Christian, as a pastor. It is a Christian ethic that from time to time in church history, an incarnational experience, a human experience accumulates Parker Palmer said it's amazing that a religion supposedly vested in the idea of incarnation so often is driven by and gets lost in disembodied concepts. We are incarnational. Human experience accumulates. And that human experience is dissonant with our received dogma. We have three options. The first two are sophomoreish. The first option is to take this experience and dismiss it outright. When Peter saw the Holy Spirit fall on the Gentiles at Cornelius' house, he went to James, the brother of Jesus, and he said, this is what happened. James rebuked him, full of the Holy Spirit, rebuked him and said, you shouldn't even have eaten with those people, much less shared the gospel. Peter didn't argue scripture. He was incarnational. He looked at James and said, I feel you. I said the same thing. All I know is when I begrudgingly shared the gospel at the behest of who I think was God, it was against everything that I knew dogmatically and doctrinally. He looked at James and said, I don't know what to tell you except I saw the Holy Spirit fall on them as it did on us in the beginning, and I don't know what to do with that. That's an incarnational experience. That's not arguing the text. James, the brother of Jesus, understood the Christian ethic. He didn't immediately accept it, but he leaned back in his chair and said, in truth, he said, how do we argue that? Five chapters later in the Jerusalem conference, James stood up and defended the Gentile inclusion and quoted Amos 9. Amos 9 didn't change. But from time to time in church history, human experience that's dissonant with our received dogma drives us back to the text, not asking, is the text wrong, but asking, have we read this most faithfully today? Because we are a group of people, the Judeo-Christian tradition is a group of people who have long lived the capacity to live with the text for centuries and not fully understand it. When Peter watched the Holy Spirit fall on the day of Pentecost, it hit him. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He quoted Joel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the psalmist. They had been living faithfully with those scriptures for 700 years, but then he saw human experience and he was like, wait a minute, that is what that was talking about. We're a group of people who live 700 years with like a, like a tender shoot out of dry ground. He would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. In him there would be no form of comeliness. And by his stripes we will be healed. 700 years we were a group of people who lived with that text, understanding it in the context. And then they saw Calvary. And they said, oh my God, that's what Isaiah was talking about. We are a group of people who have lived long, even in this country, and in a geopolitical sense, 
Our founding father said all men are created equal. They said something beyond their contextual capacity to even understand the fullness of what they were saying. They didn't know they were talking about females. They didn't know they were talking about black men. They said something beyond their capacity to fully comprehend. Church history is replete with these moments. And we are called to not dismiss. And that parent looks at me and says, I have five kids. And the one that just came out, the one that wants to end her life, she's the one of all of them who was the sweetest, the kindest, sitting on the front row of the church. Something about this is not adding up. You can't dismiss that kid. But it's also sophomores than just to reject your faith because it's not about the scripture being wrong. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount five times said, you heard it say, but I say unto you. And they said, now why would you contradict Moses? He said, see there, you didn't hear what I just said. I didn't say Moses said, but I say, I said, you heard that Moses said. The problem wasn't what Moses said. It was the hearing. When people say, don't you believe in the authority of scripture? I always say, I do. I just don't believe in the authority of your interpretation of scripture. <laughs> and if I'm going to believe in that authority, which of the 300 exclusivistic Christian denominations like the LDS am I supposed to pick? If that's who God is that's left us down here to pick between all of these talking heads acting like they've got the corner on truth, my God, I've been one of those talking heads. They're not all they're cracked up to be. <laughs> it's, it's bull and it's manipulation. But there's the capacity for the experience to drive us back to the text. At the center of our hermeneutic, or our interpretive process, there has to be a large measure of humility that says we have the capacity to be wrong and be corrected. It's the one thing. I grew up Pentecostal. My best friend was LDS. I spent as much time in the ward as he spent in the church. We were both baptized, both places, covering all of the, hedging all of our back. I'm on a roll somewhere. <laughs> But the reality is you allow the experience to drive you back to the text and again and again and again in church history. It took the Southern Baptist Convention 133 years to make a formal proclamation of their wrongness on slavery. We again and again and again have been driven back to the text the experience drives us back, and I look at parents and I say, we are in one of those moments, and I'll tell you why. Because the statistics are out. These children are suffering. Forget adults. These children are suffering. And their suffering and the percentages and the statistics around them they may not be significant for you today to change everything you've ever thought about Scripture, but they are significant enough to drive you back to the text saying, have we read this most faithfully? This is a subject that deserves to be taken off the shelf of orthodoxy, taken apart and looked at again. And you may, when you've done that, put it right back up there and say, I'm satisfied that our doctrine was right. But there are a lot of us when the experience, what happened with me, it wasn't my children. It was that I was pastoring in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, and our church was the central music forum of the Southern Gospel world and the country music world. And the bottom line is, in that world, I was pastoring so many closeted queer people. And they sniffed out my deconstruction. They could tell that I was one of them, deconstructing on theological things. And I became the unwitting pastor to dozens and hundreds of queer people. And I was already deconstructing God, Jesus, and salvation. So the broader lenses were already shifting. And they were the most beautiful people. And it just didn't add up. And I went back by the human experience to the text. And I looked at the six clobber passages for about three or four years concertedly, because I was by myself. I had no one doing it. I was doing it all in the closet. And it hit me. Oh, my God. 
we have been destroying people. We've been calling unclean what God has called clean. We have heaped burdens on people that were our burdens and not God's. And then when they fell underneath it, we pointed at them and told them it was because of their sin and didn't lift a feet. I realized I was Saul of Tarsus. I, I cried out, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. I am queer people whom you have persecuted. And I'm like, oh my God, I have crucified the Lord. I have crucified the body of Christ. These queer children that I've been trying to correct were filling up in their bodies through scars that I was perpetrating in the name of Jesus. They were filling up in their bodies the sufferings of Jesus, which were incomplete. I was Saul of Tarsus. I had crucified the Lord. And it was the same. And when they say, but how could you see that in Scripture? Because the Bible's clear on this. I said, okay, you want to hear clear? I'll give you clear. First Peter 2. Slay. First Peter 2, the guy that preached at Pentecost, the one that walked on water. First Peter 2. You want clear? Here's how clear scripture is. Slaves, be submissive to your masters, even if they beat you without cause. For to this you were called by Christ, who left us an example. You know how clear that is? It's clear enough that the Christian church defended slavery for 19 centuries. It took us 1,900 years to deal with that clear scripture. We have to have humility at the center, and there is enough happening in the lives of these people incarnationally. You are saying this is the result of their sin. What if it is the result of us crucifying them like Christ? So I'm not telling you you got to see the Bible the way I see the Bible today. I'm telling you your child's suffering is a moral mandate as a Christian to go back to the text and start with beginner's mind and say, this might be one we've gotten wrong. That's what I tell people. And that's all I do. I, If you watch, follow me on Facebook, I'm not the one that gets into the weeds of what Romans 1 says. There are plenty of books for that. I'm the one just trying to push people to be willing to go back to the text. And if you notice what I do on Facebook, I don't argue scripture. I tell stories. Because the thing that moves the needle, Nicodemus came to Jesus under the cover of night, and Jesus said, you've got to be born again. Jesus looked at Nicodemus underneath that sycamore tree with the Judean moon shining down through the branches into the eyes of one man. He looked at Nicodemus and said, for God so loved the world. That was not on a mountain. That was to one man. For God so loved the world, Nicodemus. Three times after that, he was called the disciple of the night. He still didn't come out. John 7 said, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, there were a lot like Nicodemus who would not confess Jesus because they were afraid they would get put out of the synagogue. You know when Nicodemus came out? Not when he heard Jesus say, you got to be born again. Not when John 3.16 was quoted to him in an exclusive setting. Nicodemus came out on the day he watched Jesus silently crucified. He watched the suffering of Jesus. And the Bible said when all the other Pharisees went home smugly, Nicodemus stepped out from the crowd and with Joseph begged the body of Jesus. The thing that moves the needle is the suffering of the body of Christ seen in these extensions of Christ. That's what moved Nicodemus, and that's the thing that I try to do on Facebook. I finally realized I'm a cisgender, white, evangelical, middle class, everything with all the entitlements, and I have all of these privileges, but I am not a voice for the voiceless. Queer people have as much of a voice as I have. It's not a voice I have that they don't have. I have an amplification system, a microphone, and a platform. And the way that I have dealt with my entitlements, instead of rejecting them, I steward them. And I've turned the microphone over in my platform to their stories. And their stories result in somewhere between three to ten direct messages a day from people who say, okay, I, I don't know that I... I I'm ready to start the journey. So that's what I say to them.
parents. And that, there, so the reason I said all that is because there is a Christian ethic. This is not something that we got to rely on outside philosophy. There is a Christian ethic to be driven back to the text saying we may be wrong. And the thing that does that is human experience. Whether this, it's the ecstatic experience, for me it was three things. It was the these people's testimony of Jesus, their experience of Jesus was hard to reject. The fruit of their life, it sure looked like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance to me. And the third thing was their suffering. Their suffering. That is a Christian, it's not a Christian possibility, it's a Christian mandate. And this is enough. So. Wow. Um, that's amazing. I think... I, I wish we had all the time in the world to keep listening to now, you Now, here's today. the problem with me. You ask me what time it is, I will tell you how to build a watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, if, if we were in the Baptist tradition, I think you'd have a whole bunch of us standing up and raising our Sunday hats and saying hallelujah for what you've just done. <laughs> so thank you for today. I also think I heard you just come out as a Mormon. <laughs> So, uh, Pastor, Pastor said, you're in a safe room, <laughs> and you have allies with you. I, I, would be a, a, I would be a very reorganized. Uh, no, I would be, I, I'm a part of the disorganized Church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That I, I think all of us would say, anyone that's going to be listening to this recording or is on the Zoom is going to say thank you for sure. I think we have probably time for maybe one question. I know you've got a schedule today. Um, do we have anything from the, um, maybe we'll just do it in the room here so we're not, and we'll have to apologize to those on the Zoom with questions. Um, does anyone have a question? We've probably got time for one. Because the answers are so good. <laughs> Uh, you, you guys have an opportunity to live in a world that we didn't. You guys really do. You guys are the prophets among us, honestly. You and your parents are the prophets among us. Because all, all the old preachers, they're just playing with Monopoly money and plastic chips. <laughs> Y'all are playing with every dime you've got in the world, and you have a credibility. And I would beg you, for those around the church, stay with us. If you abandon us and leave, you will get no arguments from me. I get it. But Santa Claus is more real than maybe you thought he was or we told you he was. And the same with Jesus. Sort through the dirty water. There's a precious baby in there. Stay with us. We need you. It's what I told not only our young people, but the queer people in, at Grace Point, when we began going through a process of discernment, and now all of a sudden they were going to be in the crosshairs being talked about, it's so demeaning. I implored them, please stay with us, because if you leave, we're going to be abstracting about black letters on a white page. Put a face on this. Keep it incarnational. If it's too much, don't subject yourself to abuse, but if you can, and you have to work that out with your therapist. But <laughs> stay with us. We need you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, again, I think all of us have been to a, a worship service today, and we really appreciate your time. Yo, I love you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Stan. Mm. <laughs> 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 After that, and we uh, ginger ale. Come on. I have been church probably three years, and I have signed myself up to never go to church again. But that might just change. Because I, I absolutely love hearing you guys and listening to all the cool stuff that I eat myself. I I I have this is a an ethical quandary for me because I never want to approximate Stockholm Syndrome and sending people back to the abuser. So I, I don't encourage people with queer kids to subject their kids to that. But adult people, see, honest to God, I still think Christianity has a chance to, to grow. And a while ago when I said I may be helping my religion die, that doesn't mean I believe 
that who Jesus is ends with the death of Christianity, not just Mormonism, but Pentecostalism, Protestantism. Think about it. Our founder died, and it was a part of the good news. It led to a resurrection that could have never been planned. Except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, so the death of our religion may be a part of its life. I still believe in Christianity. For those of you who can stay in your ward without subjecting yourself or your child to abuse, if you stay there because you're bullshitting and you're chicken and you're trying to play both sides, that's immoral. But if you're staying there as a humble witness to the fact that this is wrong and we believe differently, I think to be able to change from the inside, again, I know the water's dirty, but this is a really important baby. And, and people are like, well, I still believe in Jesus, but the organized church is, listen, people are always going to organize. <laughs> Every non-denominational movement I've ever been a part of begins to organize and become its own organization. <laughs> Every group of people who break away and start a house church eventually begin to create government around it. Human beings organize. It's a part of our anthropology. It's just a part of our anthropology. So, so just, you know, it, it's... Thanks for participating. It's well-organized. Yeah, I, it just is. I mean, I, hospitals are not health care. Hospitals are supposed to, supposed to be a place where health care is facilitated. Schools are not education. They are a place, organizationally, that's supposed to nurture education. Religion is not spirituality. It is a system that is supposed to nurture. Now, do we know that people can go to hospitals and get sicker? Do we know that health care can get off of its purpose? Do we know that educational systems sometimes can do everything but teach? And do we know religion can go foul? But just because there's that capacity... I'm not one who just willy-nilly just rejects the entire idea of institution because I've just watched all the people who reject institutionalization organization take their deinstitutionalization and reorganize it. It's just a part. This is organized. We need one another. So I don't know how that's going to survive, but if you can stay there, man, I don't know. That, that's kind of where I am. That's why I'm still in. And, and I honestly kind of fancy myself not uh, have to be careful with appropriation, but Harriet Tubman was my hero. When, when some got out of the slave fields, they did the necessary thing and went as far as they could to New Hampshire, got education, were inspiration like W.E. Du Bois and others, others like Harriet Tubman. And I think it's a calling. As they were heading out, they remembered, I still love these people back here. And I was one of these people, and they doubled back. I literally feel like I'm trying to help. Grace Point was kind of a religious underground railroad to get people <laughs> out. And so I think it's important. I'm, I, don't, I'm, I haven't given up on the church. Do you do Facebook for everybody? <laughs> I don't. I do a Facebook sermon once a month, and it's at the village. And sometime, like next week, I'll be at ANC. There are churches that I... I, I go to, I don't, honestly, I don't do sermons a lot anymore. I did do a sermon every week, but I'm kind of tired of sermons. And when I quit doing a sermon, I was always considered a good preacher, and that was kind of my bailiwick. I stopped doing sermons about six months ago. I have a Facebook community of about 20,000 people. If I don't post a story, 300 people are like, hey, you didn't post yesterday. <laughs> I quit doing sermons six months ago, and I thought, boy, this is going to be rough. I'm going to be inundated. Not one person <laughs> said they missed my sermon. <laughs> I just kept running to my inbox like, anyone? <laughs> People are tired of being talked at in sermons. There are better ways to communicate. Although, and I admit, I just did like three sermons right there. But anyway... Um, this was my first time, so I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. <laughs>